Okay. Y'all, thank you for coming. Uh, we're delighted to have with us Josie McDaniel Burkett signing, assisted by Holly May. Ladies, thank you again. I'll call on Joseph, Chaplain Joseph Douglas. Lead us in prayer, please. Thank you, Governor. The book of James, chapter 1, reminds us that trials are a testing of our faith that produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's hold strong to our faith, continue to love one another, and we will persevere together. Let us pray. If you are a praying person, pray with me, please. Almighty God, we come before you today and we give you thanks for another day of life. I ask your blessing upon our country and our state. I pray that you would provide wisdom to our state officials and leaders. Be, be with our medical professionals, teachers, first responders, and all of our state agencies who are leading and serving during this difficult time. Lord, I pray for the people of South Carolina that we would love one another and pursue unity and peace. Lord, lead us, guide us, and protect us from all evil. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. <clears throat> well, we have two things to talk about today, and we appreciate you coming. Uh, one is about money, and the other is about a vaccine. Uh, you know all of those things have been in the news. As you're aware, the Accelerate SC Task Force has played a vital role in the safe and swift revitalization of our state's economy. And we are confident that we are doing better than a lot of our other, a lot of the other states are doing because we've made good decisions, collaborative decisions. The official recommendations and guidelines produced through Accelerate SC and the public effort have allowed our state to gradually and responsibly remove the limited and targeted measures enacted to combat the COVID-19 virus. One important charge given to Accelerate SC, <clears throat> excuse me, was the conduct of a, th a thorough and complete review of the Federal Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, that's the CARES Act. They were also tasked with providing expenditure recommendations to my office for the $1.9 billion coronavirus relief fund that included the CARES Act for the reimbursement of South Carolina COVID-19 related expenses. On June, the 9th, on June the 10th, I provided the General Assembly with recommendations based on those from Accelerate SC for the first phase of expenditures of CARES Act funds. Those recommendations included replenishing our state's unemployment trust fund, providing resources to DHEC and the Medical University of South Carolina for statewide testing and contact tracing, also the creation of a statewide stockpile of PPE for the future, and funds to reimburse schools, colleges, and government agencies for COVID-related expenses. <clears throat> Today, I have provided recommendations, you may have a copy of it there, for the second phase of expenditures of the Coronavirus Relief Funds, CRF, from the Federal Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act. That is, these are the set recommendations for the second phase. <clears throat> First, the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. In order to prevent our state's small businesses from paying higher taxes to replenish the unemployment trust fund, I have recommended that an additional $450 million be authorized and made available to the Department of Employment and Workforce for the unemployment insurance trust fund. As you know, in the first phase, I asked for and the legislature provided $500 million into that fund. Second, for small businesses, <clears throat> I have proposed that $30 million be made available in the form of one-time $5,000 grants to small businesses, that is to small businesses that did not receive federal funds under the Paycheck Protection Program loans from the Small Business Administration. A lot of money went out under that program, but it's a lot of our small businesses did not receive that money. That would be enough money, that $30 million, 
to provide 6,000 small businesses in our state with a $5,000 grant, which we are confident would be very much welcome by all. Also, for certain nonprofits, I have proposed a similar grant for certain nonprofit organizations that were not eligible to receive the PPP loans because of their unique tax status. For example, a nonprofit like Riverbanks Zoo here in Columbia was not eligible. And while they were closed to the public, they still had to pay the employees, keep the place clean, take care of the animals. My proposal would provide $15 million to provide nonprofits like the Riverbanks Zoo with the relief they would have received under the PPP loan. As for schools, for many South Carolina families, public schools provide the opportunity for parents to work, provide housing, meals, and economic security for their children. They're literally, their lives revo revolve around those schools. When the children are in schools, that allows the parents to do many other things and of course, we know how important it is for the children to be in school for a variety of reasons. Many working parents just simply cannot stay home with the children every day, but they still, they have to go to work. They have to feed the families, provide shelter and security for their future, their medical care and everything else. If a parent wants to send their children back to school or if they want to keep their child at home, they should have their choice. Uh, they shouldn't have to choose between their child or their job. 19 school districts began this school year with their classrooms open five days a week. However, a large number of school districts chose not to provide parents with that option. Parents are not happy. I am not happy. I don't know anybody who is happy about this. I, my office, among others, has been flooded with calls from parents and concerned citizens, as well as emails and letters, and there's a sense of frustration all across the state about this. If state law allowed me as governor to require school districts to provide in-person instruction five days a week as an option, I would have issued the executive order months ago I have no authority to require the school districts to provide face-to-face -face education to the, to the children. No authority. What I can do, however, is to help those schools who have, which have opened for face-to-face -face education with the cost of doing that. The costs of in-person of in reopening are significant. And so I have recommended to the General Assembly that up to $50 million be authorized to reimburse public schools, districts, and charter school author, excuse me, and charter school authorizers for COVID-19 related costs incurred by those schools reopening and providing five-day in-person classroom instruction to the students. South Carolina's economy is returning to normal because people have returned to their workplace following precautions designed to keep them healthy and working. I believe that schools are no different. I believe that by following, by following official COVID-19 procedures and protocols, schools too can be reopened safely and sensibly the same way business manufacturers, restaurants, merchants, and state government have done and are still doing successfully today. And we announced some time ago and made it doubly clear to all the school districts, if they need the protective equipment, we will provide it at no cost. Many have asked, some have not. But we do not want the lack of the protective equipment, the personal equipment to be a reason for not allowing those children, those parents to send their children to schools. Finally, I have proposed an additional $93 million to be directed to DHEC and MUSC for continued and expanded COVID-19 testing as prevention, as well providing reimbursement to state agencies, counties, municipalities, first responders, law enforcement agencies, public institutions of higher education, and technical colleges for COVID-19 expenses. 
As you know, the General Assembly will meet next week to discuss CARES Act funding, among other issues. It is my hope that just like they did in June, they will adopt these recommendations and the state can put these resources to work to provide the needed funding and relief right away. Second point is about the vaccine. I'd like to mention that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, known as the CDC, as you know, are map rapidly making preparations to implement large-scale distribution of COVID-19 vaccines in the fall of 20.